morning, everyone. Surprise, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Stand with us if you if you will. Everybody say happy birthday, Ruth. Happy birthday. Thank you, church, so much. 
someone from you. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you and reigns inside of you is so important. It's so important to listen. Listen to him and know uh, story after story after story. Uh, Neil called me this week. And I, Neil, go ahead and give that testimony if you want, honey. We, gotta, we prayed for a young lady named Cheyenne. That's her on Wednesday night. And Neil has an update. She's a student in uh, my class, one of my classes, and um, she went to the office. She wasn't feeling good. She was an active girl and, and uh, not no health concerns, but she had a headache and she wasn't feeling well. And, and they, something wasn't right. They called an ambulance and they sent her and she had an aneurysm. And so, uh, so the mother asked for prayer and teachers were emailing her and things and here's some email and um, let's see if I can uh, she was going to have a surgery and the doctor was working on her it's going to be like a 6 to 10 hour and it wound up being 16 hours the surgery uh, the doctor was still working on her and they were doing fine and then she was out of surgery but then they had they were going to head to radiology for another scan to see if they got it all and they had to take her back and do another one uh they were going back into surgery and the mother was she was really terrified um, I think it was around midnight. They started early in the morning. It was around midnight that they were closing her up. And they were headed to another scan. And they said that Shai was doing good and resting. She tries to open her eyes. And they went, when they mess with her tubes, uh, they said they got it all. Praise God. Mom said the hardest part was not knowing much and not seeing her for 16 hours. I pray that remains the hardest part. It's going to be a long road to recovering. Mom's going to be up there. They had to close her head up without a piece of skull uh, to let the swelling go down, and that's that's a common thing. She's going to be remain sedated. Um, but now she's responding. She responded with a faint yeah when mom asked if she could hear her. And now she's doing super. She's super responsive with mom and grandma and nurses. She's been smiling and smirking. They took the EEG has been taken off. Since there were no seizures and no signs of seizures, oxygen tube removal, is next, and that will just leave her with an IV. We're not quite sure about her sight just yet, but mom is just thankful and proud of yeah. how she's been fighting. Yeah. The docs are impressed yeah. with her progress and how strong she is.
us praising the Lord forever and us, you know, and about his praise will ever be on our lips. Yeah. And um, this week I was looking back through some pictures on my iPad and I went way back, I don't know, it was 2017, 2018, back a ways on it. And I found a clip, or maybe a 15 second clip of a, of a song that I heard out in Tulsa. Just the chorus, and it's only like three lines or four line chorus. And so I, I thought, oh wow, that was nice. I forgot all about that one. But it says, the words, and it's real repetitive. One of my favorites, because I don't have to memorize a lot. I never did trust my memory, still don't. It says, to worship you I live. To worship you I live. I live to worship you. And it's, that's basically all it is. And, and a lot of you all know about the flood that hit our church in quick in 1998. Worship it up completely, not, even, not just partially off the foundation. It completely lifted it up, floated it over several yards and dropped it. Okay. And it was a total loss. We did, we did salvage some things from the inside that were salvageable, but the building itself was marked was marked for destruction, you know, for con con condemned and had to be tear had torn down. But when, after the flood hit, we were wounded. We were just kind of like, but we gathered a, a Pam and Bodie's house, friends, folks from church. Yep. And we gathered, we gathered at their house for our first meeting after that flood. And we were sitting there, and not very many people came. It was a decent little crowd, I guess, for a living room, but it wasn't all of our folks. After that flood, there was a lot of people just didn't come back. But we gathered there and we were kind of like, what do we do? We were not, I don't know that anybody actually said it out loud, but we were sitting there and we were just kind of lost. And I remember saying, I don't know what else I can do. But praise the Lord. The building wasn't us. The building we knew we knew the building wasn't a church, but, but it was our building. We loved that building. We put our blood, sweat, and tears into that building. And it was gone. But when we first started coming out here, one of the one of the first songs that I remember singing was ever be your praise. Will ever be on my lips. And by that time, we were we, we were in a different building. But I remember hearing that and thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter what. And I know I know sometimes it's hard to praise. Sometimes when things are going bad, it's hard to be thankful. But if you can, yeah. if you can, even just whisper, thank you, Lord, and start thanking you for the things that you can thank you for. Yes, I'm a, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to be thankful that, that, that I'm sick or I'm thankful for when bad things happen for those things in particular, but I'm thankful for a mighty God that can see me through anything and everything. Yep. And, and when I heard that, to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. I thought, I sat to her, I sat to her the living room and just cried and wept. And I woke up in the night, the, the last two nights, with this song rolling. I, lo I love that when I do that. When God does it, he brings yeah. a song, and it's just like I wake up, and that song, I don't think of anything else. It's just that song's going through my head. And I'm thinking, I'll worship you. To worship you, I live. You know, I, I, to, to worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Yes. I do yeah. other things. We do. We all do other things. But my purpose, my eternal purpose, I'm not going to be a wife forever. Amen. That will come to an end. Till death do us part at some point. You know, I'm not going to be a mom forever. I hate putting this stuff, you know, I love being mom. I love being grandma. I'm not going to be a daughter forever. In, in time, those things will come to an end. But I will worship forever. Yeah. That is my eternal purpose. And when you worship, wherever you are, when you worship him, I can't say it enough. It is not for his ego. It is not because God needs to be told he's magnificent and he's above everything. He knows that. It lifts you up into his heavenly places and it brings heaven to earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just praise him. Worship him. Thank him. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God. It doesn't say for everything, give thanks. It says in everything, give thanks. Whatever situation and circumstance, give him praise. Give him thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. 
while Pastor's getting his mic on. If you were baptized last week, youngins, come up here. I know a lot of you. Come here, Bentley. Come here, Sarah. You're so pretty. You want to know what you can do for the kingdom? You can hug these babies. important for us is to focus on the, uh, some of the what appears to be at times the most the, the more forgotten element of things and that's the you know we're, we look at we talk about the patriarchs a lot we talk about the great uh, men of faith we talk about that so I've always tried to settle in on for at least the last several years because we got some tremendous women of faith in this house. And I would suggest that there are tremendous women of faith in every house because as a general rule, the ladies, there are more of them than there are men. In most country churches and in most in most places, uh, you know, there's things about faith and things about Christianity in general that, that are not quite as appealing to the to the more macho element among us. But the reality of it is, is it takes, it takes both. Amen. This is not just a masculine thing because God has worked. Faith is, faith moves, it, it is far beyond, you know, a gender identity. Let me say it to you that way. But the reality of it is, is that what we teach in relationship to the patriarchs fits into the lives of women. And what we teach and what we will share today about the women of valor is not just simply, uh, is not specifically uh, or isolated to uh, the, the feminine side of the aisle, we'll say, but it is, but it's, it's the work of faith. And so that, that there should be easy to identify with that, right? Last week we talked about women of valor. Out of Proverbs 31, and we got into the Song of Solomon um, a little bit last week. And so uh, I'm going to continue in that vein. Uh, but, uh, you know, King James says, uh, you know, a woman, uh, you know, 
uh, who can find a woman, a, a virtuous woman, right? I think is how it start, the question starts out. In the Tanakh, it says a woman of valor who can find. And I spent some time last week, and I want to reinforce that, that the word virtue can be translated as valor, courage, bravery. It's also translated as army and host in different places in the Old Testament. So virtue is not just this pure, innocent, uh, you know, shrinking, violet type of, uh, uh, of character trait. When it says a woman of virtue or a woman of valor, it's talking about a woman of strength, substance, the ability to lay hold of things by faith and begin to speak and, and live in that direction. And so I want to encourage you that that's, that, that, that that element and that aspect of life is available for each and every one of us because God has given to every man the measure of faith. So we all have the capacity. We all have the, the ability. It's not just a... It's not just a, a, a thing for the, for the guys. It is something that is real and valuable for, uh, you know, for a, a humanity per se. All right? Courage and strength are hallmarks of our redeemed identity. We've been talking about that a lot the last couple of Sundays and also on Wednesday nights, which, forgive the shameless plug here, uh, you know, if you can't make it out on a Wednesday night, please join us on Facebook. Or if you don't, if that's not a good time for you and you have a better time and you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube, then subscribe and get in there. And we've archived everything we've taught so that you can stay up to speed and invested in the direction the house is going. Amen. Okay? So please, I want to encourage you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, to clap at you or something for, uh, uh, or accuse you of not doing it. I'm just reminding you that the opportunity to know what's going on and to have some sense of, of what God is saying to this house on a consistent basis, it's archived. It's out there. All you have to do is access it, and you've never lived in a day or a time when it's been any easier to do than it is now. Amen. So I want to encourage you to do that. Um, when we talk about courage and strength being hallmarks of our redeemed identity, that doesn't mean that we sail through life without storms or hindrances or obstacles. Remember, we are overcomers. We are not never go throughers of anything tough. Amen? Amen. So it's important. That we understand, Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. Oh, no. Right? Uh-oh. You said, if you don't believe in that, it doesn't matter. Jesus said it was going to happen. But he also says, be of good cheer. Control your attitude. Keep your mind set properly. Keep your heart pointed the, uh, the, the heavenly direction. Keep yourself centered and focused on his redemptive purpose and his finished work so that it centers and calibrates and balances your life in the midst of tribulation. He says, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. Amen. And so we are overcomers because he overcame. And it is his life, his victory, his triumph that belongs to you and I. When I talk about women of valor, I want to get into some specifics today. And probably, I think I have, I gave you Matthew chapter 1, didn't I, Gabe? Yeah. 1 through 16. So mm -hmm. I'm going to read this, and if I struggle with the name, I may call him Fred, George, or Harry. We're going to go through the genealogy of Jesus. And the reason I want to do it is because most of the time everybody it, it traces their, their heritage biblically through, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the name line or the, uh, the, the male bloodline. It's one of those things that it, it's not, it, you know, it's just the way humanity has lived. But in his genealogy, it is fascinating that there are going to be five women 
who show up in his bloodline. There's going to be five. And we're going to talk about women. You talk about women of valor. I want, to, I want to talk about two of those today if I can get to it. So you pray and I'll get to it. Praise the Lord. But four of them are called by name. One woman is alluded to, not by name, but alluded to or referred to so specifically that you know who she is without calling her name. And you will figure that out here in a minute if you haven't already. But I think it's fascinating that there are five women specifically brought to the surface for us to see and, and include in the story of his heritage. Five being the number of grace. I think that's a, I think that's pretty fascinating, uh, fascinating thing to, uh, to look at and look into. But we'll start here and we'll go here. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David, and the son of Abraham. Let's just keep rolling through. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judah and his brethren. And Judah begat, begat Phares and Zerah. Um, this says Tamar. It's just a, a variation of the Greek. It's te, tama, Tamar or Tamar. That's the first female name. We'll, talk, we'll tell our story here a little bit. And Perez begat Esram, Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat, begat Abinadab, and Abinadab begat Naasan, and Naasan begat Simon, and Simon begat Boaz of Rahab, there's your second name, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, there's number three, and Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. So there's the, there's the reference that's unnamed, but so specific and so, so uh, specific that we can't miss who he's talking about. Next verse, please. Let's roll on through. And Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abiah, and Abiah begot Asa. Asa begat Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begat Joram, Joram begat Ozias, Ozias begat Joatham, Joatham begat Akaz, and Akaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, you remember, Jeremiah told them when you go to Babylon, here's what you're going to do. You're going to marry. You're going to, you're going to give your sons and daughters in marriage. You're going, to, you're going to live. You're going to keep living. And you're going to keep, you're going to keep focused. You're going to plant vineyards. You're going to put, put gardens in. You're going to build houses. You're going to live there because you're not going to stay there forever. But you're going to make a home there so that when it's time to return you, there will be those to come back. You ain't quitting on me. How many of you know God's not going to let us quit on him? No. Amen. 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 So after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begot Salathiel, and Salathiel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abiah, and Abiah begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor, and Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliad. And Alien begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Mary is the last piece. But you cannot talk about women of valor in my estimation and not <coughs> look at the women that made this list. They need to be looked at. They need to be considered. And so, uh, uh, so what I want to do from here is I want to go to Hebrews 11 and 35. And I just want the first part. I'm just going to read. I, I know this is, this is all this is part of the faith chapter, but I'm just reading that first sentence to the colon there. And he's talking about faith and what faith has done. And he talks about it from Abraham and 
Jacob and, and how the world was framed by the word of God and Noah. And, and he talks about all this, but he, and, and he talks about Sarah too, specifically. But here he says, women receive their dead raised to life again. Yes. Faith yes. raises the dead. Yes. Faith yes. shows us life beyond death. Yes. That's what faith does. Yes. Faith shows us more, connects us with something greater than what's dark, intimidating, and overwhelming at times. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord. So it's, it's incredibly valuable. So when I look at this, my first thought, and we're thinking because there's so many specific instances listed in this chapter, when it says women, Receive their dead, raised to life again. We think of, I think of two things. I think of Elijah and Elisha, right? Yeah. You know, and I think it's in 1 Kings 17 that Elijah, that Elijah revives a child. Yeah. And in 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha revives a child. Yeah. And so we look at that and we think, okay, this is, that's what he's talking about. It started hitting me different last night started working down in my spirit a little bit more than just that. It's not just about, th those are in examples and, and, and stories and accounts of faith. I believe that because I believe it took faith for that to happen. But what I want to talk about now is that is the story of these women and how God raised them from death, yes. from lives that were dead, yes. that were obscure, that were, that were uh, demeaned, that were less than, that were uh, far from being noble, they were far from being uh, uh, valuable, they were far from being prized. And remember, a, a woman of valor's price is above rubies. Yes. Right? right? Yes. So the reality is, is God says there's a redeemed life in there that I want to pull out because there's value in it that will move you into a new dimension and dynamic of how to live forward. So, what I want to do this morning is I want to take some, I want to tell the stories so that the legacy, their legacy of faith will be remembered. So I'm going to tell you the story of Tamar. Now, I'm not going to read it all. It'll keep me from chasing so many rabbits. But I will tell you where to read it. It's in Genesis 38. I encourage you to go there and read it. I encourage you to read it. If you have to read it two or three times, that ain't going to hurt your feelings either. Right? But let's talk about this woman. She is, she is relatively unknown. She just kind of shows up. So to do this and to talk about these women, we're going to have to do two things. We're going to have to jump into a different culture than what we are accustomed to in the moment, how we live today and how things operate today. And we're going to have to step back in time a little bit. We're going to have to remember, right? So understand that in the, in the time of Genesis chapter 38, that marriages were not people having high school sweethearts and falling in love and getting married. I have no issues with those things. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. Those things don't happen because we know that they do. Now, I, I'm going to say they're probably rarer than the, than the romantic idea that we have out there, but I do know of successful relationships from that point, and I applaud them, and I celebrate them, all right? Now, but marriage at this point was, was, about, was about building community. And I hate to make this just kind of what, what we would look at as a mere business transaction, but there is some element to that that we can't get away from. Because what happens is, is that was that fathers made alliances with other families that they could bring the families together, merge the strengths of those clans, if you will, or those tribes, so that they would strengthen the bloodline and strengthen the, the, the resources of both families. That's what they did. Right. Now we can we can you know, scream and shriek about it and let light our hair on fire. It seems to be the standard operating procedure for 
Most folk these days, when something they don't they think is terrible or they don't agree with, they just want to scream and light their hair on fire. And, you know, there's some days that I just kind of enjoy the show. Anyway, I'll leave that alone. Uh, well, from here, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> Too late for that, really. Right? So, Judah has three sons. He's, he's, Jacob has arranged and made him a marriage, and so now he's got sons. He's got a son named Ur. There's a great name. Ur. <laughs> Sounds to me like he wasn't sure what to call him. What are we going to name him? Ur. <laughs> um, that would have been another one, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, sorry. <laughs> anyway, the second one, they may not have heard him finish the sentence. His name was Onan. Or Onan. <laughs> On another note, we'll call, we'll call him something different, right? But Ur's name means watchful, and it comes from the word that means opening the eyes to see or to awaken. Onan's name means strong, and it is uh, in the sense of effort. So what Judah does is he finds that he, he makes a deal, and he pays a dowry, and they write a contract of marriage between his oldest son and this, this gal named Tamar. And usually it's a younger woman marrying an older fella, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know. You know to what degree that is in this instance, and and, and I, I don't want to assume anything there. But let's just what, what I'm going to do here is we're going to go into it, and and what's going to happen is is that there was something about her that that was very unpleasant in the Lord's sight. There's some things in the Old Testament that's going to take you a little while to figure out and to, to just take them and to say, okay, I don't want to do with that, so I'm just going to tell you to read on. <laughs> Ur passes away, and Tamar doesn't have any children. Well, what shows up then is the law of the brother, right? Okay, again, it's a cultural thing. That if, if a man has made a covenantal alliance with another family through sons and daughters, through another generation to strengthen that alliance and and there's no fruit of that first union, then what happens is, is the next son has to raise up seed or has to take his brother's wife into his house and make her his wife as well. Now again, we get, you know, that's we're uncomfortable with that. It's not our culture. We're not talking about our culture today, okay? We're just, we're revisiting the way things have been, all right? Not with the sense of we need to get back to that on any level, but just a sense of just so we can follow the storyline. So what happens here is, is that Tamar has no children by her. <laughs> er Jr. There is no Er Jr. E-R-J-R, -R, right? Erger. <laughs> anyway, sorry. And when, <laughs> and when Onan steps up and his father says, you need to raise up seed to your brother, what Onan says is, is even if she has a child, it's not going to be mine. It's going to, it's going to belong to my brother's name. So he refuses to do it. And he doesn't stay too long at the helm either. Long story short, Tamar is twice widowed. There's another son, Shema, who is much younger. Was evidently, evidently Judah just got older too and not any smarter. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> so what he does is he promises Tamar, says you go back to your father's house and abide in your widowhood and when Shema is old enough, I'm going to do the right thing by our custom and by our the law of our land and our and, and, and how we live here. I'm going to give you to him when he reaches the age that he can do that. And so you have to go sequester yourself and hide yourself and stay in your widowhood. So let's talk about what widowhood is. Widowhood literally means to be discarded, to be forsaken, or to be outcast. 
You are not part of the social norm in widowhood. In widow, widowhood is a complete outcast. Let me tell you why, why I say that. It's because she goes back to her father's house so she will have some kind of provision and some kind of care for her. Because in that culture, you had to have a husband that, that gave you status and, and made provision for you, or you had to have a son that did the same thing, that rose up and took that place and took care of you as a mother. She had neither of those things, and so she would either be left in the street, or, and so Judah did not want to leave her in the street, so he sends her home to her father with the promise. With the assurance that at some point their families are going to mutually benefit from the covenant that they have made. And so she goes and she abides. And she sits in the shadows. And she endures the night seasons and the and the and the out of the loop, out of the out of sight, out of mind. And that's very true in this instance because when Shayla reaches his particular uh, uh, time that he, can, that he can marry, Judah makes a different arrangement without any thought for Tamar and does her wrong. By the authority and by the law of the day, he greatly reneged on his covenantal promise. That's what he did. So, she could have sat and she could have just lamented and bemoaned her misfortune. She could have said, this ain't right and it ain't fair and I'm just going to be hurt and mad and bitter about everything. But there was something in her that moved her toward the promise. There was something in her that said she had more value than to be disesteemed yeah. and cast aside and forgotten. Yeah. Can I tell you, something rose up that was a belief inside of her. Yeah. See, this is, a, this is a woman of valor. She's a woman of faith. Her life's not easy, and she's been patient, and she's been waiting. And then when she sees the door shut, she stands up and says, I'm not doing this anymore. And she didn't go out and she, you know, she didn't marry someone else, but she stayed faithful to the covenant. What she did was she went to the man that made the promise. Right. And she hid herself when she did it. She kept her face veiled, right? And so what she did was she didn't let him know that she was going to bring herself and make herself available because he had made a promise and he had failed her. Yeah. He had abandoned her and she would not live forsaken. See, there's a woman of valor inside of this. There's a woman of faith that's ready to step forward and ready to step into what she needs to do. Yeah. And so the story... As it finishes on, she plays the harlot, if you will. Why? Because Judah's wife's died and he's going back into the region where he, forgive me, purchased his wife. And you can, again, you will see that if you read the entire chapter of verse 38, the same name that he goes to. Uh, you know, is the one who is his friend and he's the time of shearing sheep. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> to, to make this story, <clears throat> excuse me, come alive a little more here, he's, uh, he has a encounter with who he thinks is a harlot, who he thinks is a prostitute. And he tries to pay, he wants to pay her, but he doesn't have, he's going to pay her with a lamb or a baby goat. I believe that King James says a kid, right? So, you know, it's either of those two things. Anyhow, and when he, to make sure that he makes the payment, she says, leave me these. 
And so what he left her was his staff and his signet ring. See, that's profound when you stop to think about he was a Bedouin. The story of a Bedouin shepherd, his family ancestry, his family lineage is carved on his shepherd's staff. It was all about his who he was because she was going to need proof at some point that she had stayed faithful to what God had said and to what, what the promise that had been made to her covenantally. She was going to need to prove that, and so she was wise enough. Hear me today. She was wise enough and clever, adept enough to be able to say, I'm going to need these things to secure payment. These are the things that will reveal the identity of, uh, and I will release them when you make the payment. And so when he, when he sends the, 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 the kid to make the payment and he can't find the, the, the woman where, where Judah had, had accessed her, then they didn't know what to do. He didn't know what happened. So what goes, what happens here? Well, Guess what? Three or four months later, it is evident that Tamar hadn't been as sequestered in her widowhood as everybody expected. You've got to appreciate this for a moment. I know there's some stuff in here that we can sit around and, and, and just chew on. There's some bones in here we can really chew on. And, and, and that's not my intent today to try to stir up controversy or strife. What I'm after here is the fact that, that when word comes to Judah that she has played the harlot, which was not exactly untrue, but he rises up and he wants to burn her. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And he feels like he has the right and the moral <coughs> position to put her down. Yeah. To either stone her, remember, Moses said, now Moses is not here yet, but all that comes out. See, all that's still part and parcel of how life was lived in this region and in these cultures. Yeah. And so... He's, you know, what he's, what he's going to do here is he's, he's going to put her down. He's going to burn her. He can stone her. Here he can burn her. And so when he shows up to do it and she shows up and she steps out and she says, I am with child by the man who owns thee. Well, I believe the tale was fully told at that point. And it staggers him. Right? Not only does it rock him, it staggers his friends. It causes the community to take a step back and realize how important a covenant of promise is. Right. Right. And it is her strength of character, I'm going to say it to you this way, her courage to be willing to lose her reputation for the promise of God that sets herself out in the forefront and everybody has to step back and say, uh-oh, we did wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Judah says to her, you're more righteous than I. Wow. I left you abandoned. I left you forsaken. I left you in the dark. I left you in the lurch. I, I did not treat you with the covenantal responsibility that I, that I was, that was due me and do you. And because you had not left you no recourse, you had to take an extreme position. You had to be moved by faith in an, into an arena that, 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 that just kind of blows the whole bottle up, if you will. And so I found it fascinating. I told Jackie this morning, I said, you know, it's amazing to me. And here's a woman that's had two husbands taken from her. She spends one night with Judah and never uncovers her face. There's, there's a whole message in some of that stuff that I don't want to get into today. But he never sees her face. So he doesn't know who she is. Right? And so because intimacy in that culture is entirely different than intimacy in the culture you and I live in. Right, right. Moving on. 
She has two husbands. She's not just a widow one time, she's a widow two times. And probably, truthfully, Shayla was pretty relieved that he didn't have the responsibility because he's afraid Tamar's going to be three for three. That's okay in baseball, but when it comes to husbands, it's not exactly the best deal. Anyway, she had lost, she had lost two husbands. And when she does what she does, God gives her two sons. God gives her, God puts twins in her womb, right? We called him by name earlier, right? Out of out of Matthew uh, chapter, I think it's chapter, go back to Matthew 1 and 3. If you don't care your game. I don't, I don't necessarily want to belabor this, but, but Judas begot Pharaoh's and Zerah of Tamar. So here's what well, I thought this is almost, there's some form of almost poetic justice in this for me from where I'm sitting. Is that is that you had two husbands taken from you by the hand of the Lord, so to speak, according to how the how the, 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 the story is worded in Genesis 38. And now, by one act of faith, God puts two sons in your womb. Yeah. Yeah. One of whom will be the primary bloodline of the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be the direct link to Judah, to the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to be the direct link if, and if that comes through her yes. if it were not for Tamar the genealogy of Jesus is not there that's why a woman of valor's price is above rubies She's willing to take a risk. She's willing to, to uh, put herself out there. And, and when it's driven by faith, she's willing to step out and say, this, there's something working inside of me that, that, that's not being fulfilled, that's not being brought to life. There's life I'm des designed and destined for more than I'm showing in this hour. See, there's so many things culturally I could say right now that I need to leave alone. But the reality of this is, is that she was driven. You can call it a biological clock if you want to. You can, you, you can just, you can just, you can call it, you know, I don't know what your terminology for it would be. And, 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 and I wouldn't necessarily quibble over some of those semantics. But let's just say there was some, some matter of faith inside of her that moved her to take this drastic measure. And the result winds up being something beautiful, right? Yeah. Something powerful. Something redemptive. Because she could have stayed broken, deserted, isolated, and, and an outcast. But she was built for more. She was made for more. There was something inside of her that said, I have to, I have to step beyond this. There's a, an identity. There's a, there's a redemption for me that is more than what I am. On this superficial level, on this earthly plane alone, there's something more that I need to fulfill in my heart. There's a yearn deep inside. Jesus. Hallelujah. And so I would submit to you that this woman had her dead raised again, yep. raised to life again. Yeah. Because she was dead in her widowhood. She was dead and separated. She was entombed, if you will. We say it to you that way. She was trapped in the tomb of her widowhood. Times two. And so when it talks about, when it talks about by faith, you know, women receive their dead, raised to life again. It's not just talking about two kids. Yes, they're part of the story, and there are marvelous, marvelous things to tell and to and to celebrate and to re give recount of. But this is more than just two, the story of two children. This is about women who have found a life and found a sense of value and importance that's far above what they would traditionally have 
hell. Yeah. And Tamar, yeah. whose name means palm tree, by the way. The, the lulabs, the palm branches, are part of the Feast of Tabernacles. What, right? Mm -hmm. Are the things that get waved. When people shout, who's there? Yeah, yeah. And I tell you, when she was getting dressed to go out to seduce, I'll use that term, to seduce Judah, there might have been a Hosanna in her heart. Yeah. There might have been something that was moving her out to, to more than what she thought possible. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Palm trees are part of the part of the woodworks and part of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. There's five species of wood they use and the palm is one of them. I'm going to try to name all of them today because I need to write them down. It's been a while. <laughs> but that's her story. And I hope I've done some semblance of justice to what, to, to what we're looking at. A woman of valor. Yeah. Be willing to Step into what would appear to be an awkward situation. But to do it with faith and to do it in, in the spirit of covenant, right? And all of that is, yeah, see, the, the thing that turns all this is the ad admission of Judah. When she shows him his staff. And his signet ring. And he looks at it and he knows it's his. He knows that he's the one. And he says to her, you are more righteous than I. Mm -hmm. What we would view and pass judgment on as being an unrighteous act. And fair enough. We've got rules for stuff like that, right? Anyway, in that instance, Judah says... What I was doing was far worse yeah, yeah. than what I forced you to do. You wouldn't have had to resort to this had I been faithful. Yeah. Had I been the man. Yeah. Had I been the person yeah. that I was supposed to be, yeah. you would not have had to resort to these tactics or these antics. See, the Old Testament's full of stuff like that. Sometimes we don't know what to do with it, so we kind of avoid it. I'm telling you two stories today. The other one's going to be Rahab. I got 25 minutes. Again, we're not going to turn and read. And I'm going to give you places to see. And Rahab is introduced in the second chapter of the book of Joshua. And she is introduced as <coughs> having a ministry of hospitality on the wall of Jericho. I kind of thought that would make get a better chuckle. <laughs> No pressure, it's too late. The moment's passed. All right. Anyway. I guess if you're going to sneak into town, you want to kind of hide out where there's a lot of people to hide out with, right? Anyway. Needless to say, if you're, let me tell you this, children of God, you decide you want to hide out where Everybody else is hanging out and hiding out. <clears throat> it don't stay a secret very long. No, no. I told my boys when they were growing up, I said, listen, you're going to be around people that seem to get away with anything and everything. Mm -hmm. I said, but that ain't for you. No. I said, it's not going to work that way for you. I said, you need to pay attention to what you're doing and you need to pay attention to who you're doing it with and you need to pay attention. Choose your friends wisely because sometimes that stuff can get you in the deepest hole imaginable. 
I said, and don't think that you are going to escape because of anything, because the hand of the Lord is on your life, and there is, you know, you're going to, you're not going to get away with a whole lot. Right. <laughs> and even if people didn't find out about it outside, they had me at the house. We'll get into that, but let's just say my sons have shook their head at times and said, we don't know whether you're good or evil. You're just telling us everything we've just done. <laughs> yeah. I said, quit doing stuff like that and I won't have to talk to you at all. <laughs> anyway, these guys went to hide and hang out at Rahab's place. Her parlor. Whatever. Her name means, actually, literally means pride. It comes from the word that means roomy or enlarging. So she was, she was open, if you will. Let me say that. She was open for business, right? But here's, here's, here's what, what's important is that the, the people of Jericho, when they found out that there were spies from Israel in the city, First place they went was Rahab's house to find them. Right? Rahab, bless her heart, had enough of intense, although she was the, a woman of reputation and a woman of, uh, that would have been considered of loose character or loose morality or however you say that, she still had something of respect for God and his people. And somewhere in the midst of whatever had forced her, driven her, or made her into the woman that the business she was in, she made an effort to conceal and to hide the spies. Yeah. 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 Because there's something about, me, uh, about Rahab that when they came and they, they, they busted in looking for, they knew they were coming. She knew they were going to find them. And I love this. This just really hit me a few years back. That she takes them to the roof. And she hides those two spies in what's called stalks of flax. Right? You say, well, flax is a, is a plant that's grown. It's the, it is actually the plant that the fibers of it are stripped out. And that's what linen's made out of. So it's no mystery to me that they didn't discover these guys because nobody looks for righteousness in the house of the harlot. Crude and unrefined it might be. Not fully developed it might be, but nobody looks for that and nobody's going to find that in her house because nobody looks there. And so she took them to a secret place. She took them to a place that probably only she knew about because it seems like it would be something that only she thought was a possibility. And she wasn't, she wasn't making linen. She wasn't spinning it. She wasn't, she wasn't trying to, to weave anything, but she had this there because it was something in her for the future. There was something in her that she was more than what she was trapped in in the moment about to get excited again. And she hid them. She had a, found a card to place and put them in there. And they were safe there, right? They were able to hide there. Yeah. Yeah. And so she spins a yarn of a different kind and tells them she thinks they've left. They went out the gate and they went this way. So they're out chasing them around. She put them on a what we would call a wild goose chase. And she, once she gets the threat out of the house, she goes and gets them out and she says, you need to wait. You need to go this other direction and hide for three days. See, I'm telling you, there was something in her she needed. She, there was something moving in her because she was, uh, you know, what looked like just a common, uh, a common woman that, that, that nobody would find value in right. other than for the moment, other than for a, a temporary fix, if you will. She, she starts to operate in a strategy that's beyond who everybody thinks she is. 
And she begins to talk to this. She says, go out this way and wait three days and then go back. They'll come back in and look for you again. And she says, but when you come, you need to save me. You need, I want, I'm asking for asylum. I'm asking for deliverance. I'm asking for acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. I can't run you out through the gate because they'll know where you come from. The only thing we've got is I've got this scarlet cord. I've got this sash of scarlet. It's woven. It's, it's put together. And we can fasten it here. And we can let you out the window. And we can, we, can, we can get you out of here under the cover of darkness. And we can get you out. But make me a promise. Oh, make a covenant with me. Ah, tell me something that gives me hope. Because our hearts melted in us. Yeah. When we heard of your exploits, when we heard of your God, when we saw what you all had done, we've been waiting on you guys to tear this place up for 40 years. Yeah. I'll tell you something. We have marvelous work in front of us to do. <coughs> And there's some folks been waiting on it to happen for a while. How about we get on with the business of making it happen? Yes. Amen. 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 How about that? That sounds pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and I love this. This is really, this really hit me powerfully today. And they tell her, I'm going to let you down by a scarlet thread. And they said, bind it to your window. And I started thinking about another character trait of that virtuous or that woman of valor. In Proverbs 31, she closed her house in scarlet. Oh, yeah, yeah. This woman puts a scarlet sash in her window. She lets, she lets them down that way, but she brings it up and she binds it to the window. This ain't going nowhere. The wind ain't going to take it out. Uh, there's nothing, the rain's not going to dampen it. When the light shines through it, there's going to be a, a red hue that comes through the window. I am binding the scarlet, the story of redemption. I'm binding it to my house because I want to save myself. I want to save my father. I want to save my mother, my brothers and my sisters. I want them all to know. Amen. And they said, bind it in your window. Bind it in your window. We'll know how to find you. We'll know where you are. And keep everybody inside. Very similar to Passover, right? Yes, yes, yes. Except what they did was on the doorpost. He said, stay inside. Don't go out the door. So she was clothing all of her house with scarlet. Praise the Lord. And so she kept that there. And so I'm thinking of the days because it's, it's at least seven days. It may have been longer, right? But they're at least going to march around the city for a while. So for day after day, the light comes through the window and all she sees is the, is the brilliance of the scarlet thread and the hope of the future settles on her. And she begins to say, she begins to thank God for the opportunity of a lifetime. She's dead. Hallelujah. She said that her word is to save me and my house from death. She's a woman who's having her dead raised to life again. Because faith is working in her. And she abides and she stays faithful and she stays true. And every time she needs a reminder, she just looks at the window. Yeah. If all goes well next Sunday, we'll get to dedicate my grandson. I want to buy the scarlet thread. To the wind of his heart. Yes, I want to see the salvation of the Lord firmly established. Yes, yes, yes. And it's not just for him, it's for that family, it's for all connected to it that would that would be content to come into the cover and come into the relationship of redemption that God has positioned us to flow in and to live in. Yeah. 
of the story will finish out. I'm about ready to close. The story will finish out in Joshua chapter 6. And I would ask you to pay specific attention to verses 22 and 23 when you read it. There's a lot more to it than just that Joshua makes sure Rahab's not forgotten. He challenges the spies that she that she saved, the spies that she made away for, the spies that, that she helped escape with their life. He charges them. He says, you see to it. You make sure that she's all right because these walls are coming down and her house is on the wall. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Your walls may be coming down. There's some walls falling in this world even right now. But if you will bind the scarlet thread and you will trust in the redemptive work and character of the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, you have a hope beyond any fallen wall, anything that would crumble, anything and everything that you see collapsing around you. Amen. Amen. And here's where he utters that famous phrase. I think it's in verse 22. He says, go. Go into the harlot's house. The men will refer to her later on as Rahab the harlot. They will refer to her just so you understand which Rahab they're talking about, not because she continues to practice this stuff, right? right. But just for a frame of reference, it's also almost a trophy of victory. She may have been, but she's not anymore, right? right. She may have she may have been caught in this in this uh, horrific uh, lifestyle, if you will, or this this uh, this deteriorating position and posture. But she found a hope that lifted her up. She may have been dead in trespasses and sins, as Paul said in the book of Romans. But now she is risen to walk in newness of life with Him who has raised from the dead. The redeemed identity is a woman of, re of valor. Yes, yes. She has been drawn out of. Yes. The house of the harlot collapsed yes. and came to closure. Yes. But the woman, Rahab, her father, her mother, and her brothers yes. and sisters yes. were pulled out of the fire. And she becomes an integral part of the story and the bloodline of the Messiah. A woman of valor who could find. I'm telling you, there's a lot more of them than we realize. We just haven't been looking for them. And I want you to understand that there may be more, but you may be more valorous and more courageous, and there may be more strength in you than you ever thought possible. But I say, you need, to, you need to look at the scarlet thread. You need to find the, the, the covenant of promise. And you need to give yourself to it in a way that, that sets you forth out of the darkness, out of the shadows, out of the defeat, out of the, out of the discrediting of, of what, what life has maybe, uh, the bus life has thrown you under. And realize that, that a woman of faith has her dead raised to life again. Hallelujah. 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 Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for this word today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I, <clears throat> I ask you, Lord, you, Lord, Father, just to quicken it, yes. to stir every heart, yes, to absolutely, Father, encourage you, each and every heart male or female today. This is not just an exclusive story of gender. It is specifically pointed that way in this instance and in these, in these stories. But Father God, faith is, it, it is not masculine or feminine. It is God. It is faith. It is all. Hallelujah. 
And I pray, Father, that we would, we would receive the strength and the impartation of that and the ability to step forward and stand forth in what you say is true of us, in what your word declares to be your testimony and your report for our life. And Father, even if we don't see the fullness of it in the moment, that we will be faithful to stand and continue to stand in the spirit of it and the attitude of it until the fullness comes. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. We give you blessing. We give you glory right now as we have our hearts reverent and our arms lifted up or our faces turned toward you. Father, we receive this word today. If you need to receive this word into your life, say, Lord, I receive right now the encouragement of your word today. Hallelujah. Let it add. Let it add strength. Let it add to me. Let it add to my testimony. Father, let me stand and let me abide in all that you say is true of me and all that you have declared this day to be my heritage of faith. Father God, we receive that and seal it now to our hearts in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Thank you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen.